I say take the shot. I can't, I mean it, Bond. Take the bloody shot. Welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roca. I am a writer, producer, and host and voiceover artist in San Diego, California. And Steve, I am so excited for us to be jumping into this movie, which is my favorite James Bond movie, and I can't wait for us to... to Pick it apart and hear what um, new tidbits of research and facts that you have to give to us as we uh, as we go along. Well, I, I, first of all, I hope that I can deliver on the facts <laughs> and tidbits. I, you know, I hope I have some good ones for you. Um, I know that art is a subjective thing and sure. film is subjective and we can't objectively say what is or is not the best of anything, except that I will say that objectively, it is not just your favorite Bond film. Yeah. It is the best James Bond film. Wow. Strong statement. That is my statement. And, and I, what I actually mean is like, Everybody's going to have different favorites. Like Spy Who Loved Me is always going to be special to me because that's my first James Bond film. I would right. never say it's the best James Bond film, but it's very special to me. Yeah. yeah. But in terms of just top to bottom, the quality of the way this is made, I would find it hard to argue that there's a better James Bond film. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there are people who have their cockles up who are massive James Bond fans, who are our listeners uh, who are maybe who are maybe countering and go no I think it's Doctor No or what we just did the watch along of um, uh, from Russia with Love is that right yeah, yeah. you want to say that again yeah no no I, I like I don't mind stumbling in these <laughs> okay yeah so from because I'm getting old and I'm forgetting things and I had COVID so I have COVID brain sometimes so yeah from Russia with Love which was a great um, watch along that we did together and it's no surprise I don't remember the title because it's the first time I ever watched the movie so. Um, but yeah, I, I, I imagine there are people who will defend those movies and some people feel like no time to die might be the best bond or casino Royale. Even a lot of people, uh, enjoy that film too, and defend it as the best bond. So it's very interesting because people have their ideas of what and who James Bond is, especially the big fans. Um, and especially those ones who've read the Ian Fleming novels and compare them to the on-screen bonds that we've had, the films that we've had, you know. Um, for, first of all, I just want to point out like what we're talking about with the watch along is on our Patreon and that's, yes. we're doing once a month, we're doing a watch along in the movie on a different film. And since we're doing bond with our regular show, we thought it'd be fun to do a classic bond as our watch along. And there's lots of announcements coming on Patreon, lots of new ways you could support the show and lots of ways that you can participate in what's going on with the show. I wanted to point that out. Um, just based on what you just said, you don't Hold just on, occur. Stop a second. Yeah. So just to let you all know. You need to go to the Patreon and support us, patreon.com slash the cinephiles and pick a multiple pick a tier that works for you. If you've been enjoying the changes, enjoying us getting more interactive with you, asking for your advice, asking for your counsel on these things, you want to go and head on over to the Patreon and see if there's a tier that works for you or jump up a tier to enjoy even more benefits. We announced some new benefits recently, Steve, on our on our live show that we did on our YouTube channel. So if you want to hear some of those benefits, go to the last five, 10 minutes of the show and it'll tell you some of the benefits. And I think we'll reveal them later on in our show as well. But yeah, definitely if you want to support what we got going on, head on over to the Cinephiles Patreon uh, and uh, pick a tier. Yeah, just want to throw that in there. This is, why, this is why it's good to have a partner, ladies and gentlemen. Like, you, you know... <laughs> Because the thing about doing a, I've listened to a couple of podcasts where it's just one person talking. Yeah. And you don't have someone to back you up and, <laughs> and, and point out the thing that you missed. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I also, so ba based on what you said uh, yeah. about Bond, you know what just occurred to me is it's Bond is like Batman in this sense, okay. which is that Batman changes with the times. And people want a different kind of Batman. So you have the 60s Adam West Batman, which is right. really campy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in the 70s and 80s, it becomes kind of the detective. And in the mid 80s, and then it gets really, really dark. And right. so each, and, and that's in the comics. And of course, in the movies, you know, it's also, it evolves with where we want him to be, yes. you know. And I think Bond, depending on when you came to him, you might have come to the really fun, campy, silly Bond of Roger Moore. And that's awesome. Yeah, that, that's what you might accept expect out of Bond, and you might, and a lot of people now at this point, 
Daniel Craig's been Bond for a real long time, and that might be the Bond. You know, that's 20 yeah. years of Bond. Yeah. And and that is a dark, gritty, closer to the Connery Bond, and definitely closer to the Bond that you find in the books. Well, I can even add to that when you say Batman. If we want to stay on the, uh, on the uh, British island, you can say Doctor Who, right? I mean, that's a lot of people feel like they're Doctor – whoever your Doctor Who is that was your entry point, that is your Doctor Who. Now, you may like other Doctor Who's. But there's nothing like your first Doctor Who, right? Are you a Capaldi person? Are you a Tenet person? Some, now the most, most recent one, Jodie Whittaker. Are you a Jodie Whittaker Doctor Who? Are you um, a Tom Baker Doctor Who? Are you even all the way to the beginning Doctor Who? It's all Matt Smith Doctor Who. It all depends on what is your entry point into. Because for me, as I, as I said on the From Russia With Love commentary, I had seen the Roger Moore and the Timothy Dalton and the Pierce Brosnan ones, and those are all great. But these were the ones that uh, the Dan and Craig ones are the ones that really showed me the power of this franchise and made me reevaluate all the rest of the films for sure. I think it's really interesting, and I know we got to get in the movie, but yeah. there are certain franchises where they went, yeah, now we're going to recast and we're going to redo it and it'll be different. Mm -hmm. So Batman gets recast, Doctor Who gets recast. Sure. We have one recast, a little bit of recasting with Star Trek. And then there are the other ones where they go, no, Mark Hamill is Luke Skywalker. That's yeah. it. Yeah. You know, or in, or Harrison Ford is Indiana Jones. That's it. And we're not going to recast. The series is not going to move on. And I don't know. I don't think there's a right or wrong here. But right. emotionally, they're very different, you know. Well, you know, the the still documentary just came out with Michael J. Fox, which is fantastic. so good. Yeah, it's so oh, good. My God. That, uh, my, that might be a short for us to talk yeah, about. Yeah, totally. Yeah, be down with that. Uh, on Apple TV Plus. And certainly that was another one of those where it came up, the idea of him of a reboot or uh, recasting of um, of Marty McFly, and he came out and said, "Look, I don't own the thing. If people want to do it, that's fine with me. I got paid. I just don't think that the people involved in, like Zemeckis and others, who really brought it to life, would be willing to go along with it." And then someone suggested Tom Holland on Twitter, and immediately my mind was like, "No, that's the way you could go. Tom yeah. Holland would absolutely be a great Marty McFly." It, it's very disturbing to me. Someone posted recently that if Back to the Future takes place today, you would go back to 1993. <laughs> <laughs> yes sir yes sir that is real upsetting <laughs> <coughs> although although and i know we got to get to the movie <laughs> it's a great film we were going to get to it but just one more thing to the new t shirt i know we got to get to the movie <laughs> no we got to get to the movie um, arguably i will say there is more difference culturally between today and 1993 than there is between 1986 and 1956 Oh, because I think you can make a case. That's there's no internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's there's no iPhones. There's no internet. There's no social media. There's I mean, like the the whole way that a, a teenager today exists. Yeah, they wouldn't know what the fuck to do in 1993. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, we were still playing what uh, Monopoly and Twister and all those games. <laughs> Hula hoops were still things in the 80s. So yeah, <laughs> those came out in the 50s. So yeah, it's a fair point. It's true. Um, so John, <laughs> let's start talking about this film. Sure. Do you remember how you first came to Skyfall? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I. I I saw it with uh, every with the crew um, because I, I think we all were like big fans of the Casino Royale film, and of course less so of Quantum of Solace. So I think I pretty much saw it with Mike and Shannon and maybe you and others uh, there in L.A. Uh, when I saw this movie it came out what 2013, 2012? 2012. So, yeah, 2012. So yeah, I definitely would have seen it there in L.A. with you guys. I would not have seen it at the house because uh, it came out in October, I think, or November of that year. So still in L.A. So yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw it with you all. I think we all saw it together. Mm -hmm. My my memory is it might have been the Cinerama Dome. Um, oh yes, I think you're right. It was the Cinerama Dome. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I've gone to. I haven't gone to every Bond movie on opening day since the '80s, but I've gone to a lot of them on opening day. Yeah, like it was always just sort of a ritual to go to do it. This is the 23rd Bond film. It's also the 50th anniversary of. James of James Bond films. It's 50 mm -hmm. years since Dr. No. Right. And they wanted to honor it. And it was, it was so so here's how this obviously saying they're going into another Bond movie is not a surprise. You know that right. they're going to make one. They have Peter Morgan, who's going to be the screenwriter. And then right in the midst of development for this, MGM files for bankruptcy. Yeah. Um, and this is obviously since it a tidal wave through the entertainment industry, but also through well, well, uh, what's going to happen with the Bond film. So it kind of goes on hold. And it sounds like it's a good thing it went on hold. Mm -hmm. What I read is it might very well be that it was Daniel Craig's idea to bring in Sam Mendes to direct. 
Yeah, it was after Daniel Craig obviously had worked with him on Road to Perdition. And certainly Quantum of Solace had gotten a lot of negative reaction. Uh, it still made money, but it had gotten a lot of negative reaction from fans and critics and reviewers. And um, from what I understand, Sam Mendes came to see Daniel in a play. And they hung out afterwards. And Mm. Daniel was the one that started the pitch of, would you be interested? Would you be willing to do it? And Sam had seen Casino Royale. And I think that was the thing that he he was, he said he was initially hesitant. Then Casino, then he went and revisited Casino Royale or saw Casino Royale for the first time, I think after Craig spoke with him. And that's when he realized, okay, if that's the kind of bond they're doing, then I'm interested. Because maybe Sam felt like, I don't want to do the, do, uh, the suave debonair bond with the quips and all of that he wanted to do something else uh and so i think that's what started the process but it took a while to, to get him on board before he finally 100 percent agreed and well, the, i mean you think about like sale is is a part of it the bankruptcy was a part of it too right well and i i think like you look at okay this is the american beauty road to perdition later right. on you know revolutionary war 1917 and you go yeah, this guy's going to do a Bond film. I mean, it just seems <laughs> yeah, exactly. seems, w- and yet that's what I think it is that combo mm-hmm. of the Sam Mendes and of course Roger Deakins aesthetic and sensibilities, yeah. but fully trying to deliver a real Bond movie. You know, that's what makes this thing so good. Yeah, I, I think he, and I know people might get mad at me for saying this, and okay, you know, I'm used to it, but like, I I think he, hmm, how can I say this without getting in trouble? I think he classed up the joint. I think he elevated Bond. Craig did. Like, I think Dalton did a great job. I liked Dalton in, in the role in the two movies he did. I liked Pierce Brosnan, certainly very debonair suave. But Craig kind of took it to another level where it could be oh, considered yeah. for as an art or Oscars or something that merits an award. And it was his just kind of strength. That's why a lot of people compare him to Connery because Connery, of course, obviously brought that kind of – uh, strength to it for at the for what it was at the time, you know, and so seeing what Craig was able to to bring to it, I think took it out of the uh, cliches or the jokes or the puns that they used to make about Bond and kind of elevated into something else. And th- I think that's what helped it to survive as much as as long as it has now to be passed on. I I couldn't agree more. I was going to say this later, but the, mm. the thing that it reminded me of. When we did Seven Samurai, and I know you're going to, some people are going to think that I'm making a crazy comparison here, and I'm not com- comparing this as films. Right, right, right. But here's the thing I remember Kurosawa was saying is there was the style of uh, kind of action uh, swordplay movies, and I forget the Japanese name for it uh, mm-hmm. off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. And, and they were always light. They had lots of action and they were fun adventures. Yeah. And what Kurosawa's intention to do was to totally deliver on the adventure aspect of that kind of a film right and elevate it and deepen it and make it more serious and that's totally what seven samurai is Mm -hmm. and this feels like the same intention we want to totally deliver on the event just like you get in any bond movie all the adventures gonna be there but we want to deepen it and make it more serious and more hefty you know well, isn't that what we do? Isn't that what great directors do when yes. they find a genre that they love or find a style of movie making that they love? Like the, it, you know, people forget this, but we've talked about this on the Godfather uh, breakdown. Like mobster movies were not seen as right. money making films; they were seen as B movies that were fun to do, but weren't really seen as prestigious films until the Godfather. You right. know, I think. I think that applies to just about anything. Horror, even with comic book movies now recently, like Logan, no one thought Logan or The Dark Knight or Avengers Endgame. Like These are like incredibly uh, well-done artistic films. Um, and so the, you have to find the right filmmakers who want to kind of come in and elevate it. And certainly Kurosawa did that for the samurai and uh, Japanese action type of films. And then you see that here with um, with Sam Mendes coming in for Skyfall, which may be why it's my favorite Bond film, because it combines the best of Bond with also this more artistic approach to it. You know? Logan's a perfect comparison, yeah. you know, yeah. because it is Logan is a I mean, it's a similar film. It's a heavy, serious movie about a person who has passed his prime and their mentor. Yeah. And, you know, like there's a lot. There's actually a lot of connections between this yeah. and Logan. Um we bring on uh, Neil Purvis and Robert Wade for the screenplay. John Logan comes in to write some additional stuff. And there's lots of controversy with Peter Morgan, who had been working on the original screenplay before the bankruptcy, saying, I deserve more credit. This is really my story. 
obviously I don't know the ins and outs of all this uh, right. and figuring out who came up with what idea and is hard. Right. But he didn't receive credit on the screenplay. Apparently his, in his version, Bond was forced to kill M himself. Right. At the end. Yes. Yeah. Because um, an old cold war love affair from M's resurfaced and her, her decision-making was questioned and what she was going to do at the end of the film to possibly, you know, get MI6 in trouble or betray her country, uh, Bond had to take her out. Yeah. Um, and we also, I just have to, I'm going to say it at the beginning, but I'm going to say it throughout, which is once again, um, Sam Bendis is working with uh, Roger Deakins, who mm -hmm. he worked with on uh, Jarhead, Revolutionary Road. And of course, later they did 1917 together. Um, I think I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. I think he is the greatest cinematographer of all time. I think you would find not many people that would argue with you. You're absolutely, I mean, I would be in that camp. You can make a very, 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 very strong case for that, for sure. And it's like, how many places, I, I'm not going to say who the greatest director is all, of all time. I don't know how to say that. I don't know. I, I could say who some of the great actors are. Right. And it's not like they're not amazing cinematographers, but man, Roger Deakins, holy shit, does the guy just deliver and deliver and deliver over and over and over again. Yeah, I mean, and and he brings in, uh, I think it's Thomas Newman to do the score, who had also done the score for his other films. So clearly, you know, Sam's like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this my way. We're going to approach it in a more artistic way. We're going to elevate this thing, and we're going to deliver a film that is going to leave a mark here and possibly change the Bond franchise or stand out from the Bond franchise. So I'm bringing in the heavy guns in all the departments to make this possible. And certainly Deacons and Newman is a hell of a combo. Oh yeah. Along with Sam Mendes as a director. Yeah. Well, and here's the other thing that, that I want to add to that, which is that, and this is what Sam Mendes said, is he said it was a great combo between people totally new to bond mm -hmm. who wanted to do things differently. And the second unit director, the stunt coordinator, the effects people like that whole team is the bond team right. that yeah. had done bond forever. Yeah. And so in, in a weird way, again, sound like a crazy comparison, what it sounds like was it was like Greg Tolan coming to Orson Welles, mm. which is that here's this great team who totally knows how to do all the action sequence in the Bond movie, but they're really excited because they have a director and a, a, and another team who is asking them to do things in ways they've never done them before. Yeah. You know, yeah. as you get that back and forth of each team learning from each other and challenging each other as they go along. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, would you like to get in the film? Uh, sure. Yeah. Let's make it happen. I, I want to set up sort of what their intention was right from the beginning, because I think it's really interesting to start with it, is what they wanted to do was make this feel like this could be the end of James Bond. Mm -hmm. Like this is, feels like James Bond's last mission. James Bond has fall, fallen apart. James Bond is over. Yeah. And then throughout the course of him, have him become James Bond again. And revisit each of the elements of M and MI6 and Q and Money Penny and transform them all. Yeah. So that we end up back at the beginning. Yeah. The um the writers said that they were inspired by You Only Live Twice and uh The Man with the Golden Gun, where oh. Bond had been uh killed or had been removed and then had to come back and what that experience was like. So they borrowed a little bit from the legacy of earlier films of Bond to play into this one. But of course, adding a former agent, I think, is, which is something we saw with Goldeneye, with Sean Bean's character. Yeah. So there were elements of stuff that had come before, but there was a way that they weaved it in that made it feel kind of unique and original. So, and one of the things in the, the direction of the, we want to create Bond at the end of the movie mm -hmm. is that we don't start with the gun sight shot of bond that all yeah. bond movies start with we yeah. skip that yeah. because we're going to save it for the end of the movie um what we start with is this out of focus shot of james bond in the hallway and uh he heads towards camera coming into focus and again the you know i'll just say it over and over again the lighting is spectacular it looks yeah. amazing yeah. and he sees some dead bodies we have that great music from thomas newman coming in they, and, and what Sam Mendes' intention was, is he wanted to start right in the middle of a mission that had gone wrong. Bronson's down. He needs a medical evac. Where is it? Is it there? Hard drive's gone. Because you're like, what the hell is happening here? 
Right. And again, this idea of a hard drive that has names, right? We saw that in the first Mission Impossible movie, that uh, that mm. knock or whatever, knock list or whatever they were trying to find. So this idea in spy thrillers that, you know, there's a list where all the agents are on one list uh, that are undercover or whatever, that's not anything new. But like you said, if you start in the middle of a mission for it, you immediately are thrust into it. Certainly the great Bond films all have that kind of opening action sequence or opening moment, as we saw in From Russia With Love. We have the you know Robert Shaw killing the fake Bond at the beginning, and it kind of gets you into that. I love that Sam is telling you what the movie is from the first shot. It is yeah. Bond coming through this tunnel, fuzzy, and then coming into focus, because that's the journey he's going to go on in this movie. Oh, Right, questioning, not sure who he is, not sure if he wants to be Bond anymore, tired of it, depressed from it. And by the end, he's much more committed to it because of what he's experienced going through the tunnel, so to speak, of what this whole uh, ex- oh, this whole mission is uh, throughout the entire movie. So he just lets you right off the bat, lets you know um, in a bit of foreshadowing what this film's all about. And I love it. I love the opening in that way, you know, because... Daniel Craig is such a striking presence with his bright blue eyes and uh, coming right into fame with that strong face of his just gets you right into the the mood of things for sure. And I enjoy that. And certainly having him have a tender moment with Ronson and also foreshadowing what Emma's going to do to him just a few minutes later when Emma's like, leave him, leave him, leave him. And he's like, no, I got to make sure to stop the bleeding. I got to make sure. And uh, but he eventually has to go and, and and chase the guy. So, yeah. Well, and this is, I mean, it's, I, I love your point about that shot of him coming forward. Mm. And and this is why this is a great film is that that conf, that is the conflict between Bond and M. And it is the conflict between the bad guy and M mm, is right. M's yeah. willingness to sacrifice the people for yeah. what her perception of what the greater good is, what the mission is. Right, right. You know, and it's a debatable thing of whether or not M is making the right choices in this film, mm-hmm. you know, but that is, so, so right, so we have the tunnel shot, as you described, we have this conflict with M, it's like, within the first minute of the movie, we've yeah. set up so much thematically. Yeah. By the way, the casting of Ronson, they deliberately cast a guy that they felt looked something like a younger version of Daniel Craig. Yeah, that's smart. That is yeah. so smart. Yeah. I'm stabilizing Ronson. You don't have the time. I have to stop the bleeding. Leave him. And there's this great look between Bond and Ronson when he gets up to leave, which is like, I'm getting up and you're probably going to die. And Ronson looks at him of like, I know you have to go and I'm probably going to die. I mean, yeah. that's what I see there. There's an understanding between the two of them. Yeah, yep. I think it's a great point, Steve. Yeah, for sure. The, one of the things they want to do was have this act, this opening action sequence progress through multiple kinds of action. So we've yeah. had like the dark, spooky, sort of thrillery stuff in the shadows. And now he moves out of the shadows, out into the brightest, busiest, most colorful world in the world. It's a huge, huge contrast. And we've gone from moving slow to now we're going to move really fast. Yeah. And he gets picked up by Naomi Harris, who I will only say her name is Eve at this point in the film. (laughs) I had forgotten that this was the reveal, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we head out driving in a great car chase through exactly where we were for much of From Russia of Love, which is we're back in Istanbul. Yeah. The sequences. uh, It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I I love the little moments as she's driving. She breaks off one side mirror. It's all right. You went using it. And then she breaks off the other one on purpose, I think. I wasn't using that one either. Yeah. She didn't give this away in interviews either. She kept saying it's Eve. She's a junior agent. She thinks she's equal with Bond, but she's a junior. Um, and she discovers that in the film. And so I like that there's this back and forth. Because, I mean, Bond and Money Penny have always had this, you know, interesting relationship yep. that at times borders on flirtation and possible you know uh, consummation of that but never really quite happened so that that i know of from the bond films that i've seen maybe it doesn't no, i don't think it ever happens that yeah, I know so of, yeah. but it's always been something that kind of hangs there and naomi gives as good as she gets with daniel craig you know she's such an accomplished actress so, yeah. i think they have instant chemistry yeah agreed the second they're with each other you're like oh i like that there's something going on here i like yeah. it it's exciting i i always find it funny that like oh yeah bond films we use audis you know <laughs> Because <laughs> that's the product placement deal. Yep. Do you remember when, when I did Siren? There was this brief moment that BMW might have asked us to make something with the BMW in it. Did I ever tell oh, you this? 
No, it never it never happened. But because right. but and it was like so far above our pay grade that we would get a, a BMW <laughs> and they would pay us money to do it. But yeah, it didn't happen. Here, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> take the uh, obviously it's a really cool chase scene. Lots of crashes. Lots of I always feel terrible for like man the world in which these uh bond chases happen or the world in which a marvel fight happens is like man it sucks to have your little store your little car be heading off to work when this is going on because they wreck a lot of stuff yeah um and then we switch to we cra- we crash the audi the guy gets out and opens fires and so it's now we okay we had the dark slow stuff car chase then we have gun battle and now we're going to jump on motorcycles and have a motorcycle chase yeah this is so, by the way, this is many, many weeks to shoot all of this. Yeah. And, and one of the things that's difficult is from day to day, this is all supposed to be one day, but in reality, one day it's cloudy, one day it's sunny, one day it's really dark, one day it rains, and yeah. Roger Deakins has to keep all of it looking bright and sunny on every seat. So every day is a lighting challenge. Wow. And it's also rigging huge distances of streets for all of the stuff to happen. It's so much stuff going on. Yeah. And uh, I love the moment, by the way, where Eve in the car knocks out her own windshield to clear yeah. it. And you just, because th- it's moments like that where you go like, oh yeah, she's a badass too. Yeah. Naomi's tough as nails, man. It's always, yeah. she, she, it, you know, this was such a great introduction to a lot of American audiences because she's obviously been, had been in some of the films and projects before, but this is the one where people really started to notice who Naomi Harris was. And it was such a great opening for her. Hundred percent agree. There's so many amazing shots in here, but one of them is after the biker, the who's Patrice, by the way, the bad guy, yeah, rides up the stairs. We end up on the rooftops, and those shots of riding along those narrow rooftops, amazing. And that's Daniel Craig doing that, right? I mean, they're not panning away from him. That's his face on the on those rooftops, isn't it? So this is what I was I was trying to find out. So yeah. some of it is Daniel Craig. Right. Some of it is Daniel Craig in front of a green screen, so he's not really riding the uh, motorcycle on the roof, and some of it is face replacement. Gotcha. So oh. they actually cuz cuz we're at that level. Well, this is now we're into 2012, you know. Yeah, good point. Yeah. You know, so we I mean, what was the movie we just did? We just did, which is 2013 is or, or 2010 is we just did the social network. Yeah. Where there's all sorts of face replacement. Right, right. Um <laughs> right with Army Hammer. Yeah, good point. Yeah. But regardless, it's absolutely seamless. Seamless. It's totally scary. By the way, they so you know if you're going to go shoot on rooftops, you have to bring a whole crew and a whole bunch of equipment and a whole bunch of stuff up to the rooftops. Mm-hmm. And initially, the only way to get to this rooftop was to go up some back stairs through a restaurant and then climb out a, ro- a window. Oof. And so you had the crew members, you know, lugging things upstairs and out this window. And finally, like, it, it wasn't just that it was exhausting, but they're like, this is taking too long. Yeah. So they literally built an elevator <laughs> outside the building in order to lift the crew up and down every day. Yeah. Right. These are the crazy things you do when you're making a movie. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. This, the stunt driving is just um, amazing. Yeah. Really- um, and then, you know, if that's not enough, you know, how do we escalate? Well, Patrice crashes through this window and now we're in the Grand Bazaar. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, we have also uh, Eve in the truck who's trying to catch up to them and cut them off, which she does. And we have Patrice, who's crashed his motorcycle, jump off a bridge onto the roof of the train. Yeah. So now we've gone from the dark and slow to a car chase, to a gunfight, to a motorcycle chase on the rooftops. And now we're on top of a train and James's choice. And this looks just nuts. Yeah. I ride my motorcycle right towards the railing of the bridge, flip over the bridge and manage to catch on with one hand to the side of the train. Yeah. Wouldn't it have been better for him to just jump off the damn bridge? Like, it just seemed weird to kind of ride the motor. I mean, there were still multiple. <laughs> it feel like there were multiple, you know, uh, carriages after the one he was going to ride on uh, so, or fall on rather. So I feel like it, it didn't seem to be necessary, but I guess <laughs> it certainly looks <laughs> cool. I had the same thought, man. It was just like, what the hell? Well, and, and I think part of it is like just we have to accept that bodies in the James Bond world are much more resilient than yeah. our bodies are because, come on, <laughs> that, that one is nuts. I just saw Fast X last night and no one defies the laws of physics and body autonomy than these guys, these people in that in those movies. But. I think I've told you I've never seen any of those movies. <laughs> Not one. We've got – God, I don't know if we can do a watch along of – because, I mean, there are better ones than the first one. Although the first one is good. Um, but, yeah, it would be interesting to do it, uh, a watch along of it, because to see the madness of it all as opposed to the first one, which is much more ground-based. Right. I was going to say, but the idea of him 
hitting the motorcycle, your legs are going to hit the handlebars. Your yeah. legs in no way are going to somehow, you know, go. you're not going to go fucking horizontal right off the bat. You're going to hit the handlebars as soon as they, uh, unless you're riding on top of the seat with your feet on the seat, you're going to hit the handlebars. And he was not doing that. So no, it, it's, it's totally, I think your initial point of like, you could just kind of ride quickly up to the edge of the bridge and this just jump over. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to crash. But he climbs up, we're on the back of the train, and I love all of the all the little stuff between Eve and M yes. as, she, as she's explaining what's going on. And she goes, What happened? They're on the train, Mom. What do you mean on the train? I mean they're on top of a train. Well, get after them for God's sake. And then, and where we end up on is at, on the train cars is there's a car that has a bunch of VW Beetles. Yes. And then behind that is a big backhoe. And James... Uh, rushes to go behind the backhoe and he climbs inside because he's out of ammo. So he's tossed his gun and, and now he, the guys, uh, Patrice is opening fire on the backhoe. Uh, by the way, Patrice is played by Ola Rapace. Okay. Um, and he gets hit. James does through the glass. Mm -hmm. And th is this, this is the wound that is yeah. the wound that he has later on. I think this one combined with the shot that, um, Eve will take here in a little bit yeah. are the two things. Cause it's on the same side of his body. Right. So it's that side of his body is right side that gets affected by these two shots. Yeah. There, there, there's a weird thing. There, there are plot things that <laughs> on careful consideration in this film, I'm like, wait, what was going on here? How dare you? <laughs> and one of them is that, cause they say later on when he finally takes the shrapnel out of his chest, yeah. that it's a uranium bullet. And then that's how they're going to chase Patrice. And I'm like, I don't know. It's just all, it all seems a little bit weird. Whatever. You don't quite, <laughs> I don't quite track it all, but it's okay. I love the shot when he takes over the, the, the backhoe and he just drives over the cars Dude. on the tr moving train. Yeah. Um, and all this is practical, by the way, this is not CG. This is like, they have a moving train and a backhoe that's driving over VW. You know, of course, Volkswagen is the parent company of Audi. So it makes sense. Oh yeah. Those are the cars that we're seeing here. Uh, Patrice shoots the coupling trying to shift it, and they have this idea, which is basically he's going to use the scoop on the backhoe as the trains separate to hold the two trains together. And this is where th – this is meeting after meeting after meeting, and it's Sam Mendes and Deacons and the screenwriters and the stunt team and the effects team and the second unit team. And they're all – and it's – and it's this is, it sounds like this is how collaboration is supposed to work. And they go, because one of them goes, well, what if he tries to separate the trains? He's like, oh, well, what if there's some way that Bond could connect the two trains? It's like, well, what if there's a backhoe and he uses the arm of the backhoe to connect it? And each one of them is building off the other idea to come right. up with this sequence. Because him, him hooking into the train in front of him to connect the two trains with the backhoe and then climbing up and running across that arm yeah. is first of all amazing. And then second of all, what I think might be the greatest shot in the history of James Bond, the backhoe rips off the back of the train yeah. and Daniel Craig drops into frame as the back of the train comes off and steps forward and it's the straightening the cuff of his jacket. Yeah. That is the shot. Which we saw, and it was in the trailer, it was great in the trailer, which we saw in From Russia With Love. This, so yeah. it, it is a... It is a Bond thing to have him adjust his cufflinks or adjust his jacket or his tie in a certain after a certain action sequence or a certain or a fight, you know, because there's just something cool about it. Uh, and certainly him jumping down with his, you know, with the shot in his arm or in his in his body, in the right side of his body, and him just adjusting the cufflink real quick and the jacket. It's so cool, man. It is. It is as cool as well. It, it is the essence of Bond to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just gone through some ridiculous, insane thing, but I'm still gonna look good and stylish and calm. It's the calm of Daniel yeah. Craig. The calm, yeah. It is just. It, I, I mean, like it's literally a shot. I, as I was watching it, I just rewound it five times mm. just to watch the shot again because I just think it's so cool. Yeah. And and we should say too that making all of this happen. I I mentioned the teams, but I didn't mention their names. So the stunt coordinator is Gary Powell, who's done you know, 15, 20 Bond films. Chris Corbould is the effects guy who's done Bond films back since Timothy Dalton. And the visual effects guy is Steve Berg. All of them, huge experience doing James Bond films. Yeah, yeah. By the way, this is also Roger Deakins' first film using previs. He had never used previs before. Okay. 
and 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 by the way, we have switched over. Uh, the Cinephiles has switched over to a new hosting service, and as part of this switch, oh, yeah. we are going to try to do something that I am terrible at. <laughs> but we're thirty four minutes in, and I think oh, yeah. it's time to hear a word from our sponsors. And now Bond is talking to M, and and I love the sort of I'm in a crazy bit of action and still having a com- conversation with my boss. <laughs> um, and he climbs up. They're fighting on top of the train. The moment that they both realize the tunnel's coming and they have to drop to the ground, yeah. And then fighting in the tunnel, super super exciting. Yeah. By the way, the fighting in the dark on the rooftop of the tunnel that's at Pinewood Studios. Oh, so yeah. that's that's not on a real train. But then when they're out when they come out of the tunnel Mm -hmm. and they're fighting not only are we on a real moving train moving across a real bridge but that's really daniel craig on the real moving train fighting on the yeah terrifying yeah i know very much so yeah and they do have safety lines on but it's still (laughs) it just looks really really scary the fight scene is great and of course what happens is is that eve gets out of her car she's got a, a sniper rifle She's trying to get a shot, and she doesn't have a clean shot. Yeah. Repeat, I do not have a clean shot. And the tension is just so high. There's a tunnel ahead. I'm going to lose them. Can you get into a better position? Negative, there's no time. Take the shot. Judy Dench is a fucking amazing actor. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sam Mendes says she's the finest actor he's ever worked with. <laughs> wow. That's, that is high praise, man. High praise. Yeah. But even in these I mean, moments, he's Paul Newman, bro, that is high praise. Yeah, yeah. I, well, he, I mean, in this movie, he has Javier Bardem. I mean, he's yeah. got a lot of good actors. This moment of just the pause and her decision—you see the thought process in her head, and then she says, "Take the shot." Yeah. And Eve hesitates, and then the line that just will haunt the whole movie, I believe: "Take the bloody shot." And all of the sound drops out. And she hits Bond. Yeah. And Bond goes off the train. Huge fall into the water. It's such a great moment, right? Because she doesn't hit the other, Patrice, at all. She doesn't even hit him through Bond. She just hits Bond. And uh, he just goes straight down. There's no screaming, no flailing around. He just goes straight down. So it must have really like either punctured a lung or affected him in some way, but he does not make any reaction and his body just goes straight into the water. It is so well shot by uh, Sam Mendes. I don't know who did the stunt of that, but they deserve so much credit because their body is perfect in perfect position as it's falling for you to have sympathy and horror and shock at the fact that Bond has been shot and, and looks like he's going to die. It, it, you have so many emotions because obviously, first of all, holy shit, James Bond just, did they kill James Bond? Oh my God. Yeah, right, right. But then you also have, you feel for M. Right. And you're angry at M. You know what I mean? You have this weird mix of sure, like, sure. of like, M just ordered Bond's death, essentially. Right. And did she do it for the right reasons or the wrong reasons? And what do we feel? And how do we feel about M? And how does M feel? And then there's Eve. Yeah who had this obvious connection with him, didn't want to take the shot. Right. And she's going to have to walk around the rest of her life knowing that she killed this guy at this moment. Yeah. And this is so great about that moment because we just saw Bond do that to Ronson, right? In essence, yep. leave him to die. Yep. He wasn't active, obviously, in Ronson's death that we know of because we we're only coming in halfway through the mission. And so, um, and then, so that with later when Eve is taking the shot here, we know that M has the proclivity already in this first few minutes to sacrifice her agents for what she deems to be the greater good, right? And once again, this is something that's really interesting to think about is the idea of the, the, the larger corporation or larger company or larger organization sacrificing um, certain individuals for the greater good, right? And in that moment, when we find out what the list is that they're chasing, um, we understand why M did what she did. We may not like it, but we can at least somewhat understand it. Um, and in the end, though, but she never takes another, Eve doesn't take another shot. She just lets homie take off on the train, which I think is interesting as well. But maybe it's the shock of having shot an agent. Because as Naomi Harris said in interviews, she's a junior agent. Right. So <clears throat> there's a feeling of like, oh shit, what have I done? Type of thing, you know? Totally. So well, and that awful. last that last look of Patrice as he yes. goes into the tunnel yes. is just chilling. 
Um, and let me tell you where this moment came from, or the idea of this moment came from, mm. is so Sam Mendez, which depresses me, is three years older than I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but that means that he was 12 years old when he went to see a little movie called The Spy Who Loved Me, my oh. first Bond film. Right, And in the opening sequence of The Spy Who Loved Me, it ends with this giant skiing down a mountain sequence Yes, with Bond, stunt Bond guy, you know, because obviously it's not really Roger Moore skiing. And that Bond goes off a cliff and there's a moment of like, holy shit, Bond's going to die. I mean, he just skied right. right off a cliff. And then the parachute with the Union Jack opens up and Sam Mendes describes, he said the whole audience, which never happens in a British theater bursts into cheers and applause spontaneously. And of course, for him, this was one of the great movie moments, and he wanted to do the opposite moment. Oh, interesting. That there's this moment of Bond falling, and there's no Union Jack. This time, he really falls to his death. Yeah, and there's, but there's also from Russia with love connections, isn't there? It's like it's on a train. Oh, sure. Right? And then also, like in the opening of From Russia with Love, Bond dies. Bond. You're fooled oh. into thinking that Bond dies or has Bond had been killed by Robert Shaw. And the end of the, and the beginning of this thing is also being fooled that Bond might have been killed by an, a fellow agent. So, yeah. Well, what's so interesting is they really, their goal was to do this very different kind of Bond movie, but totally honor Bond. There's yeah. so, so many of the references and Bond things are here. Yeah. They're just done in a different, they're not, because what I think happens, particularly with the Bond films is like, Oh, now he's going to have a quip. Now he's going to sleep with the girl. Right. Now he's going to have the gadget. Now he's going to have the, he's going to say shake and not stirred. He's going to, yeah. you know, and it's like, and there's this feeling of like, well, I have to deliver on that. And it gets really boring to me at a certain yeah. point, you know, and what they do here is they do a bunch of those, a bunch of those things happen, but they don't happen in the way that we expect them. They happen in different ways. Well, and I think that's the gift of Sam and the writers that they've approached this with giving Bond stakes, like real stakes. And certainly Casino Royale, Martin Campbell deserves a lot of credit for the Vesper Lynn storyline and the way he directed that in that film. Of course, the writers of that film as well. Um, to give Bond, to give the pattern here or lay the groundwork that this particular Bond in these series of films are going to have stakes, you know? And I think, again, there's uh, a very, that's very um, evident in the opening sequence of this film. Totally. And the, the shot of the body of Bond going over the falls Yes. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just crushing. And the, that's when the music starts. And now we go into our Adele title sequence. <laughs> I love that. this. This might be my favorite James Bond song. It was the first to win an Oscar right. for best song of all of them. And that's kind of, when I saw that, that was pretty mind blowing to me because there've been some damn good. Great songs. Yeah. Yeah. Themes are like uh fucking Goldfinger. Um, the Spy Who Loved Me from Carly Simon. Um, what's the Paul Paul McCartney? Uh, Live and Let Die. It's real hard. Live and Let Die is real tough to beat for me. Yeah, that's a great song. Yeah, Sheena Easton's For Your Eyes Only is fucking good. Duran Duran's View to a Kill is a good song. <laughs> it is. So, like, it is. you know, there are a lot of great songs in the uh, in the Bond um, films. So yeah. What, what's great about this one in particular, I think, is because it's Adele, mm. is it has that it, you feel the link to Goldfinger. You yes. Know, and Shirley Bassey. Yeah. You, yes. It's that kind of a song. You're so right. But a modern version of it. And that's why, you know, it's all this connection to early, to early Bond and to modern Bond. And the, the title design, this is by Daniel Kleinman, who did every Bond movie title except Quantum Solace all the way back to Goldeneye. Wow. And this one is really cool. I mean, yeah. these... You know, like there was a time it was like sort of looking at sexy silhouettes of partial of naked women or, you know, kind of animated right. through stuff. And this one, it's like its own movie. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's this dream sequence going through Bond, you know, from life through death. Mm -hmm. Sam Mendes, his description, what he told the the guy who created it was, this is James Bond crossing the river Styx into the underworld. <laughs> wow. Damn. And you see these <laughs> graveyards and his house and the, you know, and he's surrounded by shadows and in, in, in the hall of mirrors with himself. And it's all sort of face to face with who are, who is Bond, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And again, foreshadowing what we're going to be getting in the movie. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. And I agree. And obviously I agree with you. It is a fantastic song. Right. Uh, and now we go to MI6. And it's crazy to me that that is a real building. That is the real MI6 building in London because it is yeah. such a strange bit of architecture. You know, I imagine it's supposed to. I'm sure people feel that way about the Pentagon, man. 
The Pentagon is a weird bit of architecture. <laughs> right? It, it's a Pentagon. It's literally a Pentagon, and it's yes. such an unusual design for a a military building, yet it somehow works to instill a sense, a sense of intimidation in someone looking at it. Yeah. And the London we're going to see for the first part of the film is gray and rainy and mm. dark. And we're with M, you know, who's looking at Bond's obituary. We see the bulldog on her desk that's going to come back later. Yeah. And it's all very somber. And she's riding in her car and says, It's like being summoned to the headmaster's study. It's a new chairman, just standard procedure. Bloody waste of my time is what I call it. And then we get to meet Ray Fiennes, who plays Gareth Mallory. Yeah. This is such a great choice. I mean, yeah. Rafe had been in contention for Bond, I think, way back in the Timothy, the no, the uh, Pierce Brosnan. He was considered mm-hmm. for Goldeneye, and but they went with Pierce, and he didn't do it. But like, so to bring him back all these years later to play a character like this that would essentially replace M uh, was great to see. And you know, Rafe is one of those actors that you just, I just instinctively enjoy because there's there's no lies in Rafe. I've never seen him deliver an unbelievable moment. I mean, let alone a movie or a scene, just a moment, you know, he's so dialed into the things that he's doing. I love it. I, he's always great. And what I, what I really like about him is there doesn't seem to be any snootiness about, he's like, no. you know, whether it's, he's like, oh, this will be fun. It'll be fun to be the new M in a bond movie, you yeah, know, right. like, and, and, and then he just commits to it the way he does. I think this first scene between him and Judy Dench is great. Mm hmm. Because it's obvious that she's being, you know, called to the carpet. That's an expression yeah. I've never used, but I just did. It. That was my first time. <laughs> um, and she knows it, and they're kind of sparring with each other. Have you considered pulling out the agents? I've considered every option. Forgive me, that sounds like an evasion. Forgive me, but why am I here? He lists all the screw-ups, that they lost this hard drive, that they've put agents in danger, that agents have gotten killed. So if you'll forgive me, I think you know why you're here. Are we to call this civilian oversight? No, we're to call this retirement planning. As an actor, see, I watch movies differently than other people, right? Because I, I really watch the acting. And I know people do watch the acting, but like for me, that's what I'm sure. hyper-focused on. Sometimes I can skip story beats. Obviously, as a critic reviewer, I'm paying attention to story beats in ways that I never had before. But like, this is a big moment. This She has been M since the... Dalton Bonds or the Bros? Gold, Golden Eyes are first one. Golden Eye, yeah. So she's been a, a bit. She's transitioned from one Bond. Yeah. Uh, and this is the third one in the Craig series that she's been in. And so when he says to her, you know, um, early retirement or retirement planning, right? Judy is such a master actress that you see that just, just flicker across her face, yeah. the feeling of shock of it. But also, she's you know she's a woman who has been having to exist in a man's world, can't show emotion, can't show these things, and she's steely. So she allows you to see a little flutter of shock or em- embarrassment or shame that this would come out this way, and then she quickly recomposes herself. And as you, as Sam said, um, she's the greatest actor he's ever worked with, and this is a small example of why. Yet it says so much of her ability, you know? I, I think this is probably why, maybe, I don't know, I won't speak for you, but why I'm drawn to British ways of doing things is mm-hmm. I love the tiny show of emotion. You know, it's like when we did Remains of the Day. And that movie is so emotional for me yeah. because Anthony Hopkins is only showing, or Emma Thompson, the tiniest bit of emotion. And all through all throughout this movie, whether it's Judy Dench, obviously Daniel Craig, and also the character of Sabrin, she... She mm-hmm. also those tiny little flickers of emotion. Yes, that's what, and it draw it draws me in in this really powerful way. You're firing me. No, ma'am. I'm here to oversee the transition period leading to your voluntary retirement in two months' time. <laughs> he becomes George Clooney and up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally yes. That's totally what it is. I know I can't do this job forever, but I'll be damned if I'm going to leave the department in worse shape than I found it. Um. You've had a great run. You should leave with dignity. Oh, to hell with dignity. I'll leave when the job's done. Mm. Yeah. And this is also a small example of why she, I felt she had a stronger connection with the Daniel, Daniel Craig version of Bond than the Pierce Brosnan version of Bond. Oh, totally. Right? She, it almost is almost like she adjusted her M portrayal 
to play more within the Daniel Craig approach to his Bond than she did in the uh, Pierce Brosnan. Because she's much more playful in the Pierce Brosnan films than she is in the Daniel Craig films. And so this is an example of, of how, of why they're connected, because Bond would have said the same thing. And that's why he comes back, right? Which we find out in a little bit. But it's this sense of duty, a sense of pride in your job. And she has that. I love that. I, I mean, it is literally what we were talking about at the beginning of like the tone of the Piers Brosnan movies are different. And so she has to be different. Yeah. Um, the, the, these are serious films. I the, Here's the weird thought I had this time. And, and it happens later, too, when we're in like the um, the committee meeting or whatever it is later on. But like, I'm kind of on Team Mallory in this. It's like, OK, you did lose this. You have this disaster. You yeah. left one agent to die. You ordered the shooting of another agent. I think you should be retired. I mean, you think about like that's those are some major screw ups. And we might go, there was no avoiding them. And she did make all the right decisions. But these are big problems, you know? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, Mallory's right to call her out. The government's right to call her out. And she knows it. And I think yeah. that's why she's defensive because she knows it. She knows she got caught with her pants down on this one. And certainly, as we're about to find out, this goes much deeper than she could have possibly imagined. Well, and they're conti- they're going to continue to do stupid stuff. Yes, <laughs> throughout this thing. In the next scene, we're in the car and we hear that someone is trying to decrypt this hard drive somewhere. It's coming from MI6. What? Correction. This is behind our firewall. We should shut down. No, track it. So she is allowing this thing to stay in her system in order to track it. Right. But she thinks she might be able to track it. I mean, like how much knowledge would she have about tech and whatever at her age and her exposure and all the things that she's doing? So she's relying on Tanner, the great Rory Kinnear, who plays Tanner in the film, to be her like point person in these conversations and figuring this stuff out. But yeah, you're right. It's dangerous to be making this decision well, for sure. What's interesting, one of the other themes that we're we're going to get into more is the theme between the old school yeah. M Bond physical, personal thing right. and the new school, which is Silva and Q of, I just do everything with computers. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, and right now she is showing how out of date she is because that is exactly what the bad guys wanted her to do mm-hmm. uh, on her laptop. A puppet with God save the queen shows up and a flag, which burns away. And we see the words think on your sins. Yeah. And the moment we're looking at this, which is a major, Oh shit. We see traffic stopped. She gets out and she's yelling, you know, for God's sake, get out of the way. And then we look up and there a huge explosion rocks through MI6. Yeah. And I got to say, we're watching it this time, Steve, the CGI here is not that good. Yeah. Um, and you can see on the edges, right? Especially when you watch the 4K. Boy, it really comes through in the 4K. Mm that the CGI is not that well done. It's 2012, but still you can notice it uh, when you watch it. So a bit of a disappointment. uh, Honestly, part of what makes this movie so good is that most of this is practical effects. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I think the CG, when it's there, it really shows up. Yeah. I mean, this is, and so what what have we had? Bond got killed, as far as we know, at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. And now M's going to be fired. And then the building of MI6 blows up. Yeah. You know? So this is what Manda said. I want to destroy all of old Bond and then rebuild him. That's what we're doing. Right. And we cut from there to James Bond alive with a woman in a bed. I, I, And I think there's a moment where you go, oh, he's cool. He's being Bond. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like they got a beautiful woman and he's having a drink. He's but in then, Jamaica. He's you know, in Jamaica. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. And then very quickly you realize, oh, things are, are not cool with him. Yeah. We see him popping pills. We see him drinking. I, I do go, man, Bond's in great shape for a wounded guy. You know, <laughs> he's still pretty ripped. Um, yeah. And we end up on a beach, at, a, a bar at the beach, and we see a crowd cheering, and he's about to take a drink. And at first, you you kind of go, is there a drinking contest? What's going on? I don't understand it. And as you, he moves his hand, you see the scorpion on his hand. Yeah. That's a, cra- it's like, um, it's like a crazy Russian roulette thing, like deer hunter almost, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's such a death wish to it. Not that most scorpions will actually kill a human, but I think the implication is this one's pretty dangerous. Yeah. And he manages to drink the the drink and drop the scor- scorpion and put the glass on it. 
and everyone cheers. And then he's alone at the bar and just grabs a bottle and is drinking. Yeah. And that is when he hears the report from Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> I, I just tend to not like seeing known anchors, you know, doing this stuff. Yeah. I, I think now in retrospect, when we watch these films, it is a little. It's weird. Yeah, it's weird. It's out of place, um, especially when you see some of these other anchors who have, you know, made a big deal out of cursing Hollywood, and here they are in these movies sometimes, and you're just like, what the hell, man? You know? It's funny. I think the intention with it is to make the movie feel more real because right. you're seeing a real anchor doing the thing, yeah. but it actually tends to take me out of the movie. Yeah, because we're not in our actual world. No. So why would Wolf Blitzer be – in this particular situation, right? It doesn't yeah. make sense. Like when they showed up on in uh, Mission Impossible, I was like, "Oh, stop it!" Yeah, but the but the shot of Bond in his reflection in the background, watching mm-hmm. the news report about the destruction of MI6 and the murder of six people working there, yeah, it works really well. Yeah, um, I mean that, again, that's a, that's a part of this here, Steve. The, I mean, it's a terrorist attack. What he did? It's oh a yeah, attack six people who were working, and clearly he didn't want to kill M yet. He was torturing her, and so he killed those people to send a message to M. And this is where the villains always fall apart, is if you're doing the exact same things that um, you complained, or that is your main complaint for becoming a villain, it really erodes your stances on things. And that's what I found so fascinating about this with him, because he's killing innocent people, and he himself saw himself as someone who was screwed over by an organization, so why would he do the same thing, you know? And, and the thing is, is like, you can reject M and you can reject MI6. Right. I mean, he did just listen to M order his death. You could do that and just, you know, sleep and drink with scorpions on your hands and not not actually go and try to kill people and destroy the world, which is what Silva's show, like just rejecting one way of being a good guy doesn't necessarily mean you have to become a bad guy. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Again, it's dark. It's rainy. M gets driven home. She pours herself a drink. And the shot of Bond silhouetted way in the background is just so cool. Um, This whole scene, this is the second time they did it. Oh, wow. Yeah, the first time they shot the whole thing and Sam is looking at the footage and goes, they're all just too polite. The pain wasn't as, the pain was way too deep. Like they needed the pain to come to the surface and find its way through the performances more. Wow. And so they shot the whole thing again. You know, which is, you know, I know things I said many, many times, which is just point out a great director, a great cinematographer, a great script, two great actors, and you can totally get it wrong. And then you just have to do it again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Where the hell have you been? Enjoying death. 007 reporting for duty. So let me ask you, Steve, did she know he was alive? She goes, she says, where have you been? There's no reaction to like, holy shit, you're alive. She says, where have you been? Like, did she know he was alive with her contacts, with her agents and was like, all right, I'm fine with him being dead. Cause I don't want to deal with the fact that I shot him and he doesn't have to come put that in my face. So I'm going to leave him in Jamaica or wherever he was uh, and let him drink his life away. I will give I will give you my take on this. Okay. Which is that, first of all, you are never, ever in your life getting to get a holy shit surprise reaction from M. Yeah, that's true. That's a it's fair ne- It doesn't, I don't care if that's aliens come point. down yeah. or, you know, seven versions of her are cloned and try to kill her or whatever. The weirdest thing could happen. M is just not going to give you that reaction. That's the first thought. Here's what I actually think. Yeah. I think she didn't know he was alive. I think she couldn't believe he was dead. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. Bond has found his way out of right. every circumstances. And even though I have no evidence whatsoever that he's alive, and I know that it, that he is dead, I think she was holding on to hope. Yes. And now in this moment, she's transforming internally her holding on to hope into, I always kind of knew you weren't dead. That's yeah. what, that's my take on the okay. whole thing. All right. Fair. Fair. Um, uh, I love that she turns on the light and Bond does not look good, you know? Yeah, of course not. No. One of the decisions, and Daniel Craig and Sam Mendes, these are the small decisions that really screw a lot of people up. They came up with this idea, and they stuck to it, and and a whole bunch of people said, please don't do this. It make our lives so much harder, which is the beard. Oh. They didn't want him clean shaven wow. until a certain point in the movie. Yeah. And what that means is you have to keep uh, beard continuity. 
So yes. you have to keep, you know, because you shoot movies out of order, but beards grow in order. Right. And so <laughs> they had to redo the schedule to make sure that his beard was the proper length based on where they were at the time. The entire schedule was based around his beard, how long his beard is. What was it you said? Take the bloody shot. I think Bond has dreamt the sound of her voice saying, take the bloody shot. Oh, probably. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it begs the question, doesn't it? Like, he's on the roof of the train. He can clearly hear Money Penny and M yeah. going back and forth. Why doesn't he say, don't take the shot, or I'm going to break off from this guy, or I'm jumping down, I'm di- I'm ducking down. Like, there's, there's no communication before he takes before she takes the shot bond could have said yeah i know i get it Everyone's like oh he's fighting somebody i know but we've seen bond in similar situations say something or make a comment or make a move or whatever and so i think there could have been a possibility there where he could have said something so it's a little bit of a leap that we have to accept that he didn't say anything in this moment when he was hearing what everybody else was saying i hadn't thought about him talking back until you just said it hmm but the well, first thought, the how good that sequence is, you know? Yeah. But the first thought that occurs to me is that he knows she's right. That she has to take the shot. That she has to take the shot. Right. But he doesn't know that she's going to get it right. It hit him. No. Or but it hit he, Patrice or whatever. So, but, but how often does Bond put himself into a situation? Like, let's say driving a motorcycle at the railing of a bridge in order to land on a train right. where it's like, I could put, there's a damn good chance I could die doing this. Right. But this is what is necessary. So then why is he mad at him? Why does he say to him? I remember, I remember take the bloody shot. If he knew it was the right thing to do and it's a, and he essentially came to terms with it. Why would he still hold it over her head and hold it over Eve's head when he sees her later on in the film? Well, well, let's let me tell. Let's go to the next moment because sure, I think sure. it, it relates to exactly the question you're asking. Because mm. she says, "I made a judgment call. You should have trusted me to finish the job. It was the possibility of losing you, or the certainty of losing all those other agents." Mm. I think, because because the thing is, how much does he really punish M for killing him? Right. How much does he really punish Eve? It's not that much. Is this this his way of having a little bit of a ball busting angle or approach to this whole situation? Well, well and yes, uh, yes, definitely. And I also think humans are complicated. I can understand, True. you know, even even if you and me. I mean, there are times where we have had conflicts, yeah, and we could understand why the other person did what they did, and maybe even why that made sense. But that didn't mean it felt good, or you know what I mean, like. Right. I mean, I don't mean specifically about you and me, but just in general. No, no, you shot me off a train before. I remember. Well, I mean, like, look, you deserved it. <laughs> I mean, this is the thing. Wait, no, he doesn't shoot him because he deserves it. He shoots him. Wait, did I misunderstand them, Phil? <laughs> um, but, but like you could still be, one can yeah. still be upset that a thing happened. Oh, sure, sure. And also understand why the thing happened. You know, that happens all the time in relationships, right? Yeah. I mean, um, Lily and I still give each other shit for something I said like three years ago or she said three years ago. So, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're over it. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, she's because ne- she says, what do you expect? A bloody apology. You know the rules of the game. You've been playing it long enough. Let's just take a moment to talk about what is this relationship with M and Bond? Mm-hmm. First of all, does she have this relationship with any of her other agents? No, I don't think so. I, I don't, don't either at all. Yeah. Which is why. Mallory confronts her later and says, you play favorites with Bond because yeah. she knows. He knows she's, she's got a favorite thing for him, with him. Yeah. Well, and I think – I hadn't thought about it this way until, until we kind of got to this part of the conversation. But yeah. Bond's decision to drive the motorcycle at the railing knowing he could die, but that's the only way he thinks he can catch that guy. Yeah. M is the mirror image of that. I'm going to send people to their deaths. Yeah. I'm going to let other people die knowing that it's the right decision and knowing that it's the greater good. And so in a weird way, they're, they're peas in a pod. You know what yes, I mean? Yes. I think M and Bond understand each other in a deep way. Yeah. Not yeah, as I said earlier, yeah. like the way she left, the way she had a conversation with Mallory about like, that's why she has that same approach to things that Bond would have. She that steelier, more ruthless approach. Yeah. To things. That's why they're connected. Even though, they seem to radiate that they've come from two different sides of the track. They both have that same kind of drive at all costs to achieve what needs to be achieved for the greater good. So this is it. We both played out. If you believe that, why did you come back? Good question. Because we're under attack. And you know we need you. Because she knows Bond. 
she understands him. Mm -hmm. And, And I love that he doesn't exactly say, yes, you're right. You know, yes, you understand me. Yeah. He says, What am I? Because they're not going to waste no. time having these sweet interactions, right? It's more get to the point. They're more get to the point people. You know? I, and I love the moment after she says, you know, he's going to have to pass the test and stuff like that. I'll go home and change. Well, we've sold your flat. Put your things into storage. Standard procedure on the death of an unmarried employee with no next of kin. You should have called. <laughs> exactly. I, I I love that little poke from her. Yeah. And the next moment, and the next moment is just great. I'll find a hotel. Well, you're bloody well not sleeping here. <laughs> and what we hear is that the way the explosion happened was they hacked into the system at MI6 and they basically turned the gas on and blew it up. Yeah. And we go into their new digs, which is going into the an old building. This was part of Churchill's bunker. We're still discovering tunnels dating back to the 18th century. Quite fascinating, if it wasn't for the rats. <laughs> no thanks. Well, and what I really like is that this is, again, this is the whole intention of the film. We are rebuild. we are destroying Bond. Yeah, we're yeah, destroying yeah. everything. And then we're rebuilding everything. But we're also going back to the old, back to the beginning, back old to the school. early, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was the first place I visited when we went in 98. All right, sorry, 2019, I think. 2018, 2019. The first place uh, we visited, as soon as we landed the plane, checked into the hotel, uh, we went right to um, the Churchill bunkers from mm. World War II. Uh, oh, wow. And it was an awesome experience walking through. I mean, like I said, we had just landed, checked in, dropped our stuff off. We knew wow. we only had a limited amount of days in London, and I really wanted to go. We had a few hours because you know you arrive early when you go the overnight thing. So I'm like, let's get some food and let's go over there. And it was such an awesome experience. And everything is set up there. You could spend hours in there because everything has so much you can read about the time and the date and what was going on. And in, in this room, what was decided in, in this room, they have the map room with the Dunkirk stuff. Like it was such an incredible experience. I think it was like 30 pounds too. It wasn't cheap, um, but you got to see so much. And they walk you through it or you can go yourself. It's a 45 minute guided tour or you can go yourself uh, and, and go at your own pace. But so the fact that they were using the Churchill bunkers is pretty cool, man. I, I have not been there. That sounds like exactly the kind of tour that I would like. Oh yeah. You'd love it. And as we mentioned the Churchill bunkers, I think it's time to hear another word from our sponsors. And, and now we're back. And it's so funny. Like, you know, we've talked about how do we get our exposition out many times? Well, yeah. here the solution is we're going to give you a bunch of exposition while watching Daniel Craig work out, trying to pass these tests. So yeah. he's on a treadmill, he's doing sit-ups, he's doing pull-ups. And during this time we hear about, you know, the, the coded messages. We yeah. hear that th- this someone might be from Hong Kong or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't know who stole the list. And at the end, <laughs> They finally leave Daniel Craig after the pull-ups or leave Bond, and he completely collapses the moment they're not looking. And by the way, this was a lot of workout this day for Daniel Craig. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there was a point where he turned to Sam Mendes and is like, Sam, I'm done. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I got no more pull-ups left, Sam. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming the pull-ups are faked. But you can't fake running and sit-ups, you know? No, you're right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, like, yeah. you could have something helping you do the pull-up on, that's off camera. Right. Um, I love that we're on the shooting range, and I love all the people watching as he fires and mm-hmm. totally misses. You see how it hurts him. You see his hand shaking. Yeah. He shoots, misses again. And then I love the classic Daniel Craig, James Bond, walking forward, just rapid firing. And you think, oh, it's totally going to work. And no, he does not shoot well then either. Yeah. You know, and then we go to the psychological exam. <laughs> I'd like to start with some simple word associations. Just tell me the first word that pops into your head. Which felt like Armageddon. Which I, had the, like- I literally was going to ask that question if you had the Armageddon thought. Totally. It's that and the Dirty Dozen because we do a um, oh, word yeah. association with um, That's right. Charles Bronson in the Dirty Dozen. <laughs> but, but there's so much. What I think is amazing about Daniel Craig is there's there's almost no emotional lines in the entire movie. Yeah. Everything is all subtext. And there's so much sus- subtext here. And I love the moment first the first one he asks cuz we're doing word associations. For example, I might say day and you might say 
Wasted. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And we go through some other ones that are good, and we get to... Bird. Sky. M. Bitch. And she's watching. Yeah, and so is Mallory. Yeah. Murder. Employment. Country. England. And then he says... Skyfall. And there's a pause, and he repeats it. Skyfall. And this is where I see there's so much on Daniel Craig's face. Mm -hmm. There's so much that's happening here. Done. (laughs) And he gets up, and of course, as he gets... Because did he know that M was watching him in this moment? Uh, I don't know, but I think he sensed after the Skyfall thing that she might be watching him. Yeah, and he looks at that one-way mirror, and then he walks out. This is going well. (laughs) Bond is in the shadows, looking at himself in the mirror, pulls out a knife... And you're watching, you're like, going, holy shit, is he going to cut open that scar? Yeah. And that's exactly what he does. Pulls out shrapnel, hands it to a guy that gets analyzed, then sees Eve again. She's ready for you. Have they seen each other since no. he, she shot her? No. I don't think so either. That's why they have this interaction. I think it's great. I'm sorry. Have we met before? I'm the one who should say sorry. And that's all the apology she's going to give him, really. Yeah. You know? Because yeah. she's tough like him. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm assisting Gareth Mallory in the transition, and then I'll be back in the field. That's what you want? Yes, of course. It's not for everyone. In your defense, the moving target is much harder to hit. Then you better keep moving. Why do you think he says this? Is this a, a bit of like, what do you call this? Like sword fighting with your penis a little bit? Like he's like trying to be tough to her and show her that he's better than her, I think? Like, is it, or does it, is this this typical banter that you get with Bond and Money Penny? This kind of back and forth that a K, that just right at the end borders on a little bit of flirtatious and respect between them. I think, upon reflection, <laughs> yes. that this is. I don't think this actually works great oh. because because what I think they're doing is that it's not for everyone field work thing. Yeah is setting up that she's going to have the desk job as being because she's money penny that she's going to become the money penny that's why we're planting this right. because saying that she's not, it's not field work isn't for everyone she's a badass in the field oh totally yeah, you yeah. know and so it's a weird thing for him to say at this moment mm-hmm. you know i mean if anything he should be going you're really good at field work you yeah. know yeah and, and he and he's been in that position where he had to take the shot he was in the position where he had to walk out on ronson you know, yeah. like, so, so it's, I actually think it doesn't actually track that well. I think it track, it works as a setup, you know, yeah. um, we walk into M's office. The first thing he sees is the bulldog statue. He says, the whole office goes up in smoke and that bloody thing survives. Your interior decorating tips have always been appreciated. 007. <laughs> And in comes Mallory, and M informs Bond that he passed the test by the skin of his teeth. Yeah. Do you think when you first saw it that you believed that that was true? No, because we'd seen nothing to show us that he had passed the tests. I mean, no. he couldn't shoot. He, he was worn out and collapsed after Tanner and the other person left the room when he'd been doing the pull-ups. So it didn't make sense that he had passed. And so it's later when M says he didn't that you got, yeah. okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. My guess is I probably did think that he passed that mm. somehow like, like the, for the first time I saw it. Um, and then Mallory starts interrogating him. Mm. You don't need to be an operative to see the obvious. It's a young man's game. Look, you've been seriously injured. There's no shame in saying you've lost a step. The only shame would be not admitting it until it's too late. I think that he is talking to both Bond and M at this moment. Mm. Yeah, very possible. But I love Bond's response. Hire me or fire me. It's entirely up to you. If he says he's ready, he's ready. Couldn't Mallory have checked? Do you know what I'm saying? Totally. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because the other thing we're setting up is we have to set up the new M. Yeah, right. You know, Mallory. like, and because what they wanted for, for Mallory was you think he's a jerk at the beginning. Yeah. And then he redeems himself both to Bond and M, but also to the audience. And then by the end of the movie, we're on board with him, you know. But like you said, your team Mallory, you kind of see Mallory's point of view in a lot of these situ- your early yeah. actions, even though he's being portrayed as someone who might be an impediment to Bond achieving these missions. 
It, it's funny that this movie is also sort of institutionalism and machines and mm-hmm. standards versus individuals. Yeah. Yeah. M in the end puts her faith in individuals. Again, Bond. that's why you have someone like Sam Mendes. That's why you bring yeah. these writers along because they understand that there's a, there's a commentary to be made here beyond cool British guys solving stuff, you know? As long as I'm head of this department, I'll choose my own operatives. Fair enough. Good luck, 007. Don't cock it up. <laughs> and this is also where we find out about the fragments that he had had analyzed, these uranium shells only used by a couple people, and that's how we find out about Patrice and that he's going to be in Shanghai. Yeah. Here's a question. Yeah. And I'm going to preface my question by saying, I don't think this makes sense. Okay. But I'm going to ask, is this all a setup? In, uh, explain for, yeah, what do you mean? Well, Silva, to go for forward, needs to get captured by Bond right. in order to be brought into MI6. Right. Bond finds Silva by finding Patrice, mm-hmm. by getting the, the chip, and he finds Patrice and gets the chip because he was shot with a uranium bullet that yeah. only a few people use, including Patrice. Right. So was he shot with the uranium bullet in order to find Patrice? Because none of this could happen if he didn't have uranium shrapnel analyzed. He doesn't go to Shanghai and can't find Silva. That is my... So was all this a setup? It's a good question because how can you bank on the fact that Patrice was going to be able to shoot him? And and that Bond would have the thing analyzed and that they would... I think... Well, this is why if you go backwards, this plan makes no sense at all. It's totally (laughs) ridiculous. It only works going forward when we don't understand what's going on. I think he had a plan, but then he adjusted as things happened. That's the way I kind of look at it. But of course, as you say, you're more of a screenwriter than I am. So from so I can get away with those kinds of leaps in logic in my mind. And well, maybe you can. And we, as long as the audience, it's like, yeah. it's just my favorite thing in Armageddon, not my favorite thing in Armageddon, but something that I just love in terms of filmmaking is that and mostly because I've pointed this out to people and most people just don't catch it, which is that we're in the South uh, China seas on an oil rig. Bruce Willis gets on the fastest jet airplane, leaves everybody on the oil rig. 24 hours later has the meeting with NASA and then says, well, I'm going to need my team. And then we have the amazing sequence of them gathering the team from around the United States. It's like, you just left them two days ago in the South China sea. AJ has his own business with a rusty sign. It's like they've been there for years. He's already started it, yeah. It totally makes no sense. It's, it's completely cool. not. And yet the montage is so awesome. And I mean that totally sincerely. I'm not trying to cut down the movie. No. That montage is that nobody thinks about the fact that this makes no sense because it's awesome. Yeah. You know? You don't look for logic in a Michael Bay film. But yes, well, you're absolutely well, right. But this is the same thing here. As long as we're moving forward and following the clues, yeah, yeah. You, you don't have to think backwards through right. how did Silva set this up? Was this really his plan? And because it doesn't because we're already there, you know. W seven. You are ready for this. Yes, ma'am. And then after he's gone, as you said, Tanner turns to M and says, I didn't know Bond passed the tests. He didn't. Bond is looking at a painting of an old ship, and who sits down next to him but our new Q, Ben Wishaw. Yeah. Love Ben Wishaw, such a good actor, um, such an interesting actor who's played so many fun parts. It, for me, who's watched a lot of British stuff. And so it's, he's such a, he, I remember at this moment, like I didn't know much about him, but when he did, had this scene with Daniel Craig, you're just like, oh man, this is a perfect cue for the new generation. You know? Exactly. Well, and it was funny. So they're, they're sitting, they're looking at this painting of a uh, old warship, which they're really in the National Gallery. I think this is a very famous painting. Yeah. And he says, Always makes me feel a little melancholy. A grand old warship being ignominiously hauled away for scrap. The inevitability of time, don't you think? And then he turns to Bond and asks Bond, What do you see? A bloody big ship. <laughs> yeah, because he's like, he's not going to give him anything. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. well, it's Sam is like, he's, well, I think what Sam Mendes said, I don't know if this is an exact quote, but he said something like, James Bond is, a, is immune to metaphor. <laughs> uh, okay because i guess Q, so yeah. because q is looking at the ship and relating it to m and bond you know yeah. these these great warships being hauled away for scrap and bond's like i'm not i'm not going there with you yeah you know uh and he introduces himself and then 
Q uses the argument we're later going to hear from Silva, which is basically... Well, has it I can do more damage on my laptop sitting in my pajamas before my first cup of Earl Grey than you can do in a year in the field. Oh, so why do you need me? Every now and then a trigger has to be pulled. Or not pulled. It's hard to know which in your pajamas. And that's, again, we're back to this theme of the difference between the human agent, the real person, and the system and computers and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and then he gives him his ticket to Shanghai. And we, who have been set up for meeting Q, go, okay, what are going to be the cool gadgets? Like, what's Bond going to get? And he gives him a Walther PPK. The only gadgetness to it is that there's a sensor and a grip that reads his palm print, so only he can shoot it, mm -hmm. and a tiny little radio transmitter. A gun and a radio. Not exactly Christmas, is it? Were you expecting an exploding pen? We don't really go in for that anymore. And what's so great is that we're referencing classic Bond. Yeah, of course we are. We're also going back to the beginning of Bond. Because, like, you know, we just watched uh, From Russia With Love. They didn't have crazy gadgets. They had a briefcase with, you know, a couple of things in it. Yeah. Not not nuts things. And the other thing, this is what Sam Mendes said. He said, look, we live in a world where you can walk into the Apple store and get more crazy gadgets than Q could possibly provide. It doesn't, It that doesn't make sense anymore. We have to go back to the beginning in order to be different, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. So he... Uh, exits and we head off to Shanghai. It's a city I really want to visit someday. Mm, certainly, the way it's shot here by oh my Dickens God. and, and Mendes, it looks amazing. And they they only filmed the aerial shots in Shanghai, mm. so they didn't actually film there for any of the stuff with the main characters. But the establishing shots is in Shanghai. Right. Phenomenal shot of Bond swimming in a pool on the rooftop. Yeah, that's great. Where I go. Man, what's the budget of MI, the travel budget of MI6? Man, you'd be able to expense some nice stuff. Um, I just like the fact that he's still wearing the blue trunks from Casino Royale. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> he hasn't traded up. He hasn't traded up. Um, listen, when you get a nice pair of trunks that fit you right, I mean, I guess, that. I guess that's the way to go. <laughs> Look, if I looked as good as Daniel Craig in that bathing suit, oh, I would, my God. I would stick with it too. Right? Yeah, 100%. Uh, we head off to the airport, watch as Patrice get off a plane following him driving uh and now we're by the way this is shot in one in london and i forget what the building they're at that they shot it but bond watches him go inside watches him kill a security guard does nothing watches and then follows him inside goes up an escalator and then i love the moment patrice gets on this glass elevator and bond runs up and jumps and catches onto the bottom of the elevator <laughs> which is a move you know I do like the moment that his arm gives out on him. It's just oh, reminding yeah. the audience in a subtle way that this is still an issue he's dealing with. So I yeah. like that they threw that in. Sam was smart to kind of throw yeah. that in. And then we're, this is all a set, this sort of gla totally glass surrounded space that we're going to be in now. It's a set and it's a set built with all the flashing lights of Shanghai on the outside of the set. Yeah. And again, Roger Deakins, man. Yeah. You know, it's like, this is like, it, it reminds me of the Die Hard under construction sort of set mm -hmm. where he fights yeah. the guy, yeah. except this is elevated visually to like a level, uh, no criticism of Die Hard, of course, but it just looks absolutely stunning. This is in my top 10 of the most beautifully well shot fight scenes ever, which we're going to get to in a few seconds. But yeah, I mean, the, the way he's using the neon glow from the buildings um, and the lighting here and the darkness and the light, uh, how he uses all of that. In these, um, in these, on these floors with these uh, window walls, it's just incredible. It, it is completely stunning, and I don't know how. You, like anytime you use glass, then you yeah, have to right. worry about reflections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's like, well, where is the lighting equipment, and where are the where is the camera, and where is the crew, and how do you do all this without seeing reflect? I mean, and it just looks well. And this is where it's like there are so many Roger Deakins movies where there's sequences where. You just go, I cannot believe how beautiful, like, like in mean, Blade Runner 2049, there's so many sequences oh, yeah. where it's just like, I can't believe how beautiful this is that I'm yeah. looking at, you know? And we see him pull out a device, which is like to cut through the glass on the side of the building. And he's putting his gun together. And what we look and we see across the way in another uh, skyscraper is a lit room and in walks a few people, including uh, Bernice Marlowe, who's severing, who is... Mm. absolutely stunning yes yeah, gorgeous man and they're looking 
at what looks like maybe a painting. And I love, by the way, we've cut through the glass. I love just the sound design when he removes the piece of glass and you hear the outside world. Yeah. And also because we're in this totally glassed in environment, Bond doesn't really have anywhere to hide. Right. right. You know, mm -hmm. so he's just trying to move in the shadows. So it's super, super tense. Yeah. And we see them welcome in like a guest to this room across the way. They have a painting. They reveal it. Apparently, this is a Magdalani. And it's one that has been stolen that nobody knows where this painting is. Oh. And so that, which I think is a really cool thing if you knew it, which of course I didn't when I watched the movie, but yeah. And Bond, you my expectation is like, oh, Bond's gonna stop him from killing this guy. Right. But he's not, because he doesn't care. Right. He's not gonna about this guy. And in fact, I think he calculates I'll have a better chance of getting this guy if I wait till after he's fired the shot. Right. Which he does. And then Bond comes in and you're right, man, this fight in silhouettes is so great. Yeah. I rewatched it like three times because it is so fast. And, you know, with, with Keanu, I look, I like the John Wick movies, but I can see when the fighters are pausing to allow Keanu Reeves to catch up. And if you watch all your favorite martial arts movies, you can absolutely catch the guys waiting to hit their strikes so that the star doesn't get so that the choreography right. works, right? In these in this one-on-one -on -one scene, I don't see that for a second no. anywhere throughout the fight. And I don't know how hard they worked on it, uh, these two stuntmen and the two actors, but they nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. And it's so well shot by Deacons and Silhouette that it worked. And you can hide things, obviously, in darker, uh yeah. in a darker set with the fight sequence, but I think it's still comes across as a ferocious fight between the both of them. I do know they trained a long time to do this fight. I mm. do think uh, Daniel Craig and the actor playing Patrice did a bunch of it. I don't think they did all of it. Yeah. I love the moment where they fire the guns and it lights up their faces briefly. Yes. Yeah. That's just super, super cool. And, and then the final moment where he kind of flips him and the guy goes over the side and he's holding him with his hand. Yeah. It's just like, Oh shit. And he's asking for a name doesn't get one hmm. um and the guy slips out of his hand and falls yeah and bond is furious with himself yeah and the other thing that's happening is there is this woman across the way watching this happen yeah. and he looks at her she turns away and he looks through the equipment and finds a chip a, like a casino chip that yeah. says macau um that's, that's severine right watching him yeah across the yeah. yep yeah gorgeous and then we're back with them and we hear that the bad guy has posted their first five names. Yeah. And another, it, it looks like it's on YouTube and shit. So yep. it's well, interesting. Yeah. And another image comes on her computer and says, think on your sins. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Macau. Let's go. Um, another fascinating city that I would love to go to because it was Portuguese and then it, you know, it's returned to China, but it's mm -hmm. got all these casinos. And then we cut to him lathering up because he's finally going to shave that beard <laughs> and who knocks on the door and comes in but eve cutthroat razor how very traditional well i like to do some things the old-fashioned way sometimes the old ways are the best a fantastic again it's burying the exposition because we're going to hear all sorts of exposition about posting the agents and yeah, yeah. what was decrypted and all this stuff but what it's really about is their flirtation and he hands her the straight razor and she, and the shot is so sexy. Yeah. She's kneeling between, which is like, why would you ever shave someone like this? But she's kneeling between his legs and slowly shaving him as they flirt and talk about spy stuff. It's fantastic. Already briefed me on the list. Raising the tantalizing question of what you're really doing here. My official directive was to help you in any way I can. Like spying for Mallory. There's also a moment where they mentioned Mallory and yeah. that there's more to him, that he was a lieutenant colonel, that he's, you know, that, that he actually has done some stuff. And, and he knows about it. She thinks that he yeah. doesn't know about it, but he does know about it. He's just, he's being a dude. He's yeah. being a dude. And then as she shaves him, he reaches down and unbuttons her blouse. Mm -hmm. And she lifts up his chin and says, Keep still. This is the tricky part. 
and then runs that straight razor over his Adam's apple. That's better. You look the part now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what part's that? And she wipes some of the lather off his face and says, Old dog. New tricks. <laughs> Such a cool scene. I, I could so picture, because I've had this moment where the screenwriter came up with that line mm. and went, it just kind of lead back and kind of had to pat themselves on the shoulder and go, yeah, yeah, old dog, new tricks. Nailed it. Got it. I got it. Uh, I'm going to ask probably a silly question, but uh, do they have sex after this? I don't think so. I don't know. I, I, I don't think that they do. I think that's one of the gifts of the the Bond money penny relationship. That is that it always walks up to the line, but doesn't cross over. Like even from Russia with love, didn't we have a sequence where they were like face They're to flirting. face? They're flirting. Yep. Flirt, yep. Or like literally yep. cheek to cheek. Yep. Yet it doesn't. So- happen right so. i have t- i have two different thoughts okay so at this point in the movie i don't know this is money penny uh, so yeah. if you if you show oh, me a scene okay. if you show me a bond scene that where yeah. where sh- he unbuttons her blouse and she's, he, she's between his legs kneeling in front of him yeah and then you cut away my brain goes obviously they had sex right but I completely agree with you. I think for the Bond money penny relationship, it's important that they've never had sex. Yes. That's critical to the relationship. So I'm going to say that they didn't, even though probably the first time I saw it, I would have thought they did. Um, Naomi Harris on the Empire podcast said that scene, the scene we just talked about, actually got cut short. It was originally cut so that you would know categorically that nothing happened. But then they went back and re-edited it so they left the meaning a bit more open that they might have. Oh, so you you talk about a screenwriter, talk about an editor. Editor's like, ah, I got it, cut it, so that maybe people yep. think they had sex, nailed it. And it's so funny because like you just do an extended look, and you yeah. don't have, and you don't have because I'm that means there probably was a moment where they pulled away from each other at the end or got right. interrupted, right? And they took that out, yeah. And then we cut to what is his approach to the casino in Macau that's absolutely incredible, and this is not in Macau. That is <laughs> this whole thing is built on a set. This is all at Pinewood. I think this it's shot on a tank. It took months to build. It is among the most beautiful things in a Bond movie ever. His approach to this casino in Macau. Yeah. I don't know why he's standing on a little boat in his tuxedo as they sail. That actually doesn't seem like a safe way to deliver cool. somebody. He does look cool. He's Bond. <laughs> he looks beyond fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah. And all the lanterns and the glowing dragon and the, I mean, just, uh, it's just Daniel Craig. It's so great watching him in the, you know, the Glass Onion um, movies. Yeah, playing yeah. this totally different part because the guy's a great actor. But man, does he pull off some stuff just in his presence as Bond. Yeah, the Benoit Blanc stuff and him and Logan Lucky. I love mm. how much a departure from the Bond stuff yeah. that it is when he does that stuff. As he enters the casino, we see the Komodo dragons down below. Oh my God. And I love their little conversation where they are obviously listening to each other through their ears. Yeah. Um, and I like how they shot it so you don't ever really see their lips moving. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's almost like voiceover. Yeah. He walks up to the cashier, pulls out that chip. I'd like to cash this in, please. It was a long look. <laughs> she goes away. We see Severine there, and she come, and then the and then the cashier comes back with this huge briefcase and says, yeah. "Good fortune tonight, sir." <laughs> and he opens it up, and there's millions in cash. Yeah. Now this money was supposed to go to Patrice for killing the guy with the painting, right? Right. Again, I ask the same question. So was this the setup? Did they need Bond to get hit with the uranium bullets to follow Patrice to get the to get the chip to come here to get the money to get to S- Severine and have her take him on the boat. I just think he's, I think he's adjusting on the fly as the plan goes along. Who is Bond or Silva? Silva. Okay. Um, Cause I don't think they anticipated Bond. I don't think they, they how could you factor? How in could you the, anticipate it? Yeah. Well, how would you know? Yeah, right. How would you know that Bond would not stop Patrice from killing this guy? And then how do you know that Bond would actually be able to, dismantle patrice and you know have him die on the edge of the building you can't right so you adjust as it goes along if he shows up with a chip we'll do this if he doesn't we'll do that you know? okay i think that's fair that makes sense yeah i'm just saying um, he's, a, he's a intelligent guy silva and certainly been a former spy 
So I'm sure he can understand what Bond might do. He might not be able to predict, though, what exactly will happen. Yeah. And then after he gets his money, it's millions of mon- of euros, I think, mm-hmm. uh, then uh, Severine comes up to him and says, Now you can afford to buy me a drink. Maybe I'll even stretch to two. By the way, she's a, a mix of French and Cambodian. Mm. Um, and that's part of what gives her that look, you know, that's just yeah. so, she, she's just stunning to look at. Yeah. Um, and they talk about the money. I've been waiting to see who would redeem the chip. You made such a bold entrance into a little drama. Did I overcomplicate the plot? Who doesn't appreciate the occasional twist, Mr. Bond. James Bond. She's pretty. No, no. If you like that sort of thing. I'll keep you posted. And drops his earpiece in her champagne glass. <laughs> so they didn't want to have him say a martini shaken, not stirred. Oh, right. So what they did was the next shot, we see the bartender shaking his martini. Yeah. And he takes it and says, that's perfect. <laughs> so that's what, you know, they wanted to pay that's homage it. to all the stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Only a certain kind of woman wears a backless dress with a Beretta 70s strap to her thigh. One can never be too careful when handsome men in tuxedos carry walkthroughs. Uh, you know, you got to love Bond flirting stuff. Oh, yeah. And then, but then this is where it takes this turn is he says, I want to meet your employer. Her reactions are so subtle yeah. and so great because it's just the slightest tremor in her hand as she smokes. Right. Where you see how scared she is. Right. So again, if this is planned, how would she know that? It, why would she be unsettled by the fact that he wants to meet her employer if this isn't planned, if this was planned, you know? So, well, that's what's so weird about it is yeah. like, that that's what that's why I think it works forwards, but not necessarily backwards, mm, fair. you know, mm-hmm. um, because it, well, well, we'll get to the because the other point is, well, di- is was this all a setup for her to get Bond on the boat and bring mm. him to that island? Yeah, maybe. Or was she genuinely hoping that Bond would kill him and then only got betrayed on the boat? Cool. Good question. And he turns over his wrist and sees this tattoo and goes and realizes that she was probably a child and part of the sex trade. You know nothing about it. I know what a woman is afraid and pretending not to be. And I love this moment. I love this this exchange. She says, How much do you know about fear? All there is. What do you think that tells us? Well, that she's opening the door to connect with him by asking this question. Her defense is the logical defense you know nothing about it because obviously he's not been a sex slave you couldn't pass even just even if you guessed correctly you couldn't possibly know what this life has been like right to be in a situation like this and so her opening the door to revealing a little bit more of herself after that exchange i think is implies that she's open to bond caring about her right because he wouldn't have turned it over he wouldn't have called her out on her fear like he wouldn't have highlighted it if there isn't a level of care here about her, I don't mean affection, I mean care as one human to another, you know? So there's something about his eyes or something about his energy that she immediately trusts. Or it's a setup. Th- that it's a setup by her? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's the, if, if, if Silva's whole point is to get Bond to the island and she works for him, it's yeah, her- but then she tells him we're, it's not too late to retreat when they're on the boat. So I don't think she's 100% on board with this plan. Oh, I definitely think she's afraid of Silva and would – well, and I, 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 don't know that the, I don't know that there's an answer. But I think it could be that she is working for Silva. This yeah. is part of the plan to bring Bond to the island. She is, but she knows that Bond is probably going to die if she brings him to the island. That She has sex with him on the boat and then goes – Maybe you don't, and has affection for him then, and goes. Maybe you should try to get out. So, of do it. you think the sex is a, is a setup to lure him in? No, because he's already on the boat, so you wouldn't need the set sex. No, no, no. Set lure. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I I think it's that she she was sent there to do a job, but there's something about him and the way he's asking about her. Yeah, I agree with that. Heard yeah. about her that it, he she senses that maybe there is a way out of this. There is a way out from Silva. 
Maybe. Well, and it also, again, I'm going to just say the same sentence I said multiple times now, but like, I think it works really well forwards and not mm-hmm. so much when you try to back it up and think about like, wait, Silva's plan is so thin and bizarre of how yeah. he's going to get Bond to this island. But um, the the moment I actually wanted to ask about is she mm-hmm. says, ask him about how much do you know about fear? And he says, all there is. Yeah. Because I think what's so great about that line is that Bond doesn't show fear. Like, no. That's not a thing we see of him. And him saying that says, I'm afraid all the time. You know what I mean? Like, I've been through every single kind of fear you can imagine. Yeah. You know, fear of torture, fear of death, fear of losing people I care about, fear of everything. And But I keep going. Can you kill him? Yes. Will you? Someone usually dies. Which to me is saying, either he's going to die or I'm going to die. Right. I love her laugh. It's so full of fear and hope and kind of madness, I think, you know, of everything she's been through. When I leave, they're going to kill you. If you survive, I'm on the Chimera. North Harbor, Bath 7. We cast off in an hour. And Bond raises his drink to those bodyguards. So he's heading out. He's got that big briefcase. And of course, there are the bodyguard, the, these guards that won't let him out. He starts to push the case down. And then the big case uppercut into the big guy takes out the other two. And then, of course, they get knocked over the bridge into the pit with the Komodo dragons. Yeah. And this is this is like Roger Moore Bond. This is like the crocodiles in like Live and Let Die. This is yeah. like the sharks in um, The Spy Who Love Me. Like this is... Now we have to deal with the big animal and have the fight scene. So they're, yeah. they're, they were actually interested in honoring the Roger Moore movies too, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we have a big fight and it ends up that that guy, you don't put turn your back on a Komodo dragon and he gets attacked by it and Bond uses that to escape. Yeah. Steps up on the guy and jumps up out of the pit as the guy gets attacked by the dragon. Hands off the suitcase to Eve and says, put it all on red. <laughs> and exits. Do you think it's just a normal thing for Komodo dragons to eat people in this place? Is that nobody like there's no security that runs over, there's no big deal that happens. It's just oh well. Yeah. So so dragons. first of all, I did have to look up how dangerous are Komodo dragons really are. They are dangerous. They yes, will they, they will go after a person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I had the same thought of like, nobody's doing anything, you know? Yeah. It seems odd. Yeah. I mean, just as like in terms of hospitality, if I'm a guest at this casino. And hear someone screaming from the Komodo dragon. Yeah. I would want someone to do something about that, you know? I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, we make it to the port. An unbelievably beautiful sailing ship. Severin's yeah. there. There's champagne in a bucket. There's two glasses. And Bond's a no-show. And she's disappointed. And we cut to, again, a gorgeous shot of her showering with the steam just perfectly obscuring what it's supposed to obscure. And Bond just steps into that shower with her. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, a bold move, but it is Bond. It's a bold move, Cotton. Let's see if it works for <laughs> Um, and, and again, this could have been right out of a Roger Moore movie. Right. Oh, yeah. I like you better without your beretta. I feel naked without it. Yeah, I do want to say... Um, the performance here from Berenice Marlowe is, is fantastic. And, you know, sometimes we can discount quote unquote Bond girls and not think that they're also actresses, also working on creating characters. Um, and apparently she went pretty deep into the Bond mythology to kind of um, combine multiple energies into what she was doing, um, including Grace Jones's performance in View to a Kill. But the one she talks about the most is Famke Jansen, Zian Anatop. Mm. That's the one that she really kind of felt was the angle that she wanted to go with. Because she liked that she was a woman who commanded her space and uh, dictated what she was doing, but also um, you know, understood the power of Bond in, in certain moments. So she wanted to have that uh, energy in what she was creating. So I think she deserves a lot of credit for that. And she went so far as to like uh, quote be quoted as saying that she looked at Heath Ledger's Joker which had been only a few years earlier to explain some of the more uh, maddening uh, moments that happened Mm. in confronting the stuff with Silva. So that is really interesting uh, performance by her. And I, 
I mean, a lot of people don't mention her as one of the best Bond girls, and I think she's actually Bond women, I should say, and I think she's actually damn good uh, in this role and in this moment too. She's as sexy as Bond is coming in, you know, and, and it's so great. And I think as Bond sails off with Saverine to meet whoever the bad guy is, this is a pretty good point to end part one of our exploration of Skyfall. So, and of course, we'd love to hear your thoughts, at least on the first uh, part of Skyfall. You can reach us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for The Cinephiles. You can follow us on Twitter at Cine underscore Files, The Cinephiles podcast on Instagram. You can subscribe to the show at all of the subscribing places like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. Please leave your reviews, not just on Apple Podcasts, but if you've left one there, Jump on over to Spotify if you can, because I believe you can leave reviews there now as well. Yeah. Spotify is the second place that people download the most episodes of The Cinephile. So if you have time to check that out, please do. You can buy or stream um, Skyfall from cinephiles.net. And you can uh, support the show, as we talked about at the beginning of the episode, by going to patreon.com slash the cinephiles, uh, where we have we are about to roll out a whole new set of tiers that we would love you to participate in. Yeah. And if you want to reach me, it's SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And we are finishing the first season of Star Trek, the animated series on Enterprise Incidents. So check that out. John, how would people find you? Uh, you can always find me at the Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca Says, uh, and my other podcasts, uh, The Geek Buddies and The Hot Mic. And I do want to say, as Steve mentioned earlier, we want to announce that um, Red Circle, uh, we are now on Red Circle. We have moved off of uh, Anchor, and we are now on Red Circle. They reached out to us and d- delivered us a wonderful pitch. Uh, and so we are very happy to be moving to a network that we feel is going to be doing even more to elevate the cinephiles and get us to where we want to be uh, on the next level of things here on the show. So, um, you know, if you guys uh, check out the stuff over at Red Circle, make sure you uh, check out the stuff we've got going on over there as well. So uh, it, we're going to stay and obviously on all the podcast platforms, but Red Circle now to being uh, the home of the cinephiles for sure. Um, so, and we really look forward to this, a whole new era for the cinephiles, which we're really, really excited about it. And I think that's it for this week. We'll be back next week for part two of our exploration of James Bond and Skyfall. <laughs>